Our next speaker really needs no uh, introduction. He really is uh, a present-day uh, giant in cardiac and aortic surgery, and I and we very much looking forward to his talk in the different surgical options for aortic arch replacement. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again. And um, I'll show you some ideas about uh, different options for arch replacement. And I'll show you two, I hope, very entertaining videos. And I'll just remind the projectionist that I will need sound towards the end of the presentation, please. So we've had a lot of options for arch replacement in the traditional open era. And now with the addition of all the hybrid procedures and the stents and the debranchings, we have even more options. It's hard to know which one to pick for a specific patient. I'd like to spend a moment thinking about the uh, zone zero hybrid procedures that were mentioned by Dr. Taylor. It's been recognized pretty well now that if you instrument the ascending aorta for construction of this extra anatomical bypass graft, you face a pretty high risk of aortic dissection. So now the recommendation is to replace the ascending aorta. Well, you have to go on bypass to replace the ascending aorta. I really don't understand the wisdom. If you're going to go on bypass, why don't you do the real operation and be done with it? I, I just don't understand the wisdom of this. That's one comment that I wanted to share with you. Among the, the <coughs> surgical options, we have patch repair and we have trifurcated grafts. It's hard to choose between the two. There aren't randomized trials. If you try to compare clinical series, the patients are so different and the surgical methods are so different, it's, it's hard to make a choice. And uh, really, the preferences that we have are all linked to our training and our experience. And we make that fit the pathology at hand. As I mentioned in the last lecture, I think uh, the hemi-arch is a good operation, and you don't have to do a total arch, probably for the majority of your ascending patients. The ones whose aneurysm ends before the innominate artery, a hemi-arch is a great way to treat them. You don't have to do the more extensive operation for many, many of these folks. Now, there are all these creative non-anatomic options, and we've seen them illustrated already this afternoon, and we have those. We must not uh, forget not only Dr. Madalana's operation, but also Kachuko's arch first technique. There are so many variations to choose from. One small point I'd like to make is all of these techniques are dependent on good exposure. And I can tell you, you can divide the innominate vein with absolute impunity. I've done it thousands and thousands of times, and nothing happens. The arm doesn't fall off and the brain doesn't swell. I've done it thousands of times. We published it many years ago. And that alone improves tremendously your exposure. You can crank your retractor as far as you want, and you've got nothing in your way. You don't have to be pulling the innominate vein uh, up and down. These techniques, the patch and the trifurcated grafts, they all work well. I use them both. Each has some pros and cons. The patch graft, it's anatomic. It's one anastomosis. The length and lie are secure, and it's quick. It has some cons. It's hard to reach beyond the subclavian. It's relatively inaccessible for repair after you're done. And if there is arteriosclerotic disease of the branch vessels, you haven't addressed that. The trifurcated graft has pros. Uh, all your anastomoses are done to small vessels, so they're quick and they're very secure. There's no tension in the wall of those vessels. They're accessible for repair when you're done. And if you have arteriosclerotic disease at the origin of those vessels, you've eliminated it with your transection. It has some cons. For me, it's hard to stuff all those branches into the descending aorta when I'm doing the elephant trunk. It's hard to stuff them down. And it, it's hard to get the exact length of, of graft proximal to your elephant trunk when you pull it out. It's somewhat time consuming. It does require um, anti-grade cerebral perfusion because of the extra time for construction. And the length and lie have to be optimal, otherwise you'll have problems. 
and especially if we look at the series from Japan, I've been a reviewer for many of them, there are unexplained deaths that occur uh, in the first three years. Not early deaths, but late deaths. And I suspect many of them are related to sudden thrombosis, like we saw illustrated in a case earlier this afternoon. Many uh, innovative ways, uh, we've discussed some of these already this afternoon, to perfuse for the trifurcated graft. But just compare that, if you will, to the simplicity of operating under deep hypothermic arrest. All you do is the operation. You don't do any uh, perfusion uh, adjuncts. And I've talked about this with you briefly. My preference is for the patch technique, uh, for its simplicity and uh, its directness. And you can avoid all this stuff. Um, the, our experience with a deep hypothermic arrest has been uh, mentioned already. I'd like to look at a couple interesting aspects of the testing that we've done for this. We're up to 1,000 cases now done under deep hypothermic arrest. I've used perfusion twice uh, in my career for very, very complicated cases. And um, um, <clears throat> Dr. Zaganshin from our, our research group will be presenting this work at the, the, the 1,000 cases at the uh, AATS uh, in a few weeks. But anyway, we've looked at the neurologic outcome every which way but backwards. We've done post-operative testing. We've done pre- and post-operative testing. Um, and we've looked at even the, co the results in individuals with a high cognitive demand for their occupations. If it's an assembly line worker, a truck driver, we thought you might miss subtle deficits. So we selected individuals with very, very, very high cognitive demands. These are PhDs, these are professors, surgeons, um, university administrators, musicians, artists, all people where the brain is the heart of who they are and what they do. We thought if there was any deficit, we would notice it in them. These were the deep hypothermic arrest times. And this is the comparison of their pre- and post-operative status. We compared them not only to their own pre- and post-operative status, but to that of a similar group of patients done without a need for deep hypothermic arrest, in other words, just an ascending aortic replacement. They were no worse off than the straight aortic replacement, and we joke about it, but three means no change from their pre-operative level. And we joke about it. Some of them were a little bit smarter after we were done. So we're pretty confident that it protects the brain very well. We don't know any other ways that we can look at it. Everything measurable, including our testing panel that was designed by neuroscientists. In terms of actually perfusion, we all love perfusion. Every organ was meant to be perfused, especially the brain, as was beautifully outlined by uh, uh, the prior speakers. But it's not so simple. Which vessels do you perfuse? Dr. Harrington covered that perfectly. We don't really know exactly. Even if you perfuse both sides, are you taking the time to clamp the subclavian to prevent a steal? Flow rate, you covered that beautifully. I'm convinced that 10 cc's is too much, and we're producing cerebral edema. I'll tell you, the ones done under perfusion, I think they're groggy. The ones done under straight deep hypothermic arrest, they're very, very sharp, and I hope if the sound works, that I can convince you in a few moments. Uh, then there are the issues of vessel trauma from your cannulas, introducing air in particles, and how about dissected great vessels? I'm always a little bit reluctant to put cannulas into those. This is from Dr. Diabartolo Mayo's group. They, they showed very clearly on PET imaging the abnormal metabolism and the cerebral edema after antigrate perfusion, and it took three months to go away in this patient, the left panel to the right panel. That doesn't look benign to me. That looks pretty bad. And we must remember that Svensson actually compared the three techniques. He did neurocognitive testing similar to what we did. And um, he found deep hypothermic arrest came out better. So um, island patch or trifurcated, I think they're both viable options. They both have benefits and liabilities. The choice will depend on the individual patient and anatomy, and especially on your experience and comfort level. I don't think any one of those two surgical options prevails. I think uh, both of them are very important. But uh, I think we should all remember that ACP is not entirely benign. 
And you can't keep sowing indefinitely uh, for a multiple uh, vessel anastomosis without some detriment to the brain. Um, now I'd like to take a moment to focus on an aspect of arch replacement that doesn't receive much attention. And that is, how do you retrieve the elephant trunk when you're doing your stage two? Your arch repair isn't complete until you've, you've done your stage two for an arch aneurysm. How do you retrieve that? Well, th these are the options. You can surround the aorta and the contained elephant trunk. That's not often so easy. You have a, usually a huge aneurysm that you're dealing with in the distal arch and proximal uh, descending aorta. You've kept your elephant trunk as short as you can for fear of producing paraplegia. And you've just operated there four weeks ago from the other side through a median sternotomy. So it's all edematous. You may still have some hemorrhage around there. Uh, and then there's the question of injuring the esophagus or injuring, injuring the nerves. It's not a benign thing to do. Another technique is to use deep hypothermic arrest, but that to me seems to be defeating the purpose. The reason you're leaving the elephant trunk is so you don't have to do the deep hypothermic arrest from the left side. You can sure get your elephant trunk very easily that way, but I, th I think you're introducing some extra complexity. Another way is to use adenosine and produce um, a cardiac standstill. Uh, some places do that. I haven't uh, used that because we use uh, mainly option one and option four. Option four I call the, th the finger thumb technique where you go fishing for the elephant trunk. And I'll show you an entertaining uh, video for that in just a moment. So we find all of these uh, by uh, TEE. If you're going to use the finger thumb technique, you need to know exactly where the end of your elephant trunk is. Because if you're below your elephant trunk, you're up a creek without a paddle. So we always locate it by, um, by TEE. And then um, what I like to do is I like to make an incision that's about two to three centimeters that exactly matches my thumb and my index finger. And then once that incision is made, just putting the thumb and index finger in there um, seals the opening. Of course, you have no control. You're completely uncontrolled if you um, lose uh, that elephant trunk. And then uh, I, I fish it out with my finger and thumb. Uh, and then once you've got it out between your finger and thumb, you're golden. Um, so this is a little a video that I'll show you now. Um, here's the elephant trunk located by TEE, so we know exactly where we're going. We visualize it in two dimensions, so there's no doubt. And then there's a couple little spurts of blood here, but nothing significant. So we know right where we are from the TEE. We make the incision and the finger and thumb, and you go fishing. It's a little bit uh, uncertain until you get it. And then you have a wonderful feeling, wonderful feeling when you know you have it. <laughs> and, then, um, and then the clamp goes on. Now you'll see it was a little bit folded on itself with the clamp application. So then we just unfolded it and got it flat in the clamp. And then uh, we're home free and good to go. A couple things to keep in mind. There's no margin for error with this, um, <laughs> as, as uh, you can exsanguinate in seconds. Something I learned um, is that the graft, if it's been in there a few weeks, it may adhere to the side wall of the aorta. And you have to be prepared for that. It'll, it'll come into your finger and thumb, but you have to be prepared for that. The first time that happened to me, I said, I couldn't figure out why I didn't have both, both margins of the graft, the near and the, and the far margin. That's because it was adherent to the wall. In dissection cases, you have to be sure that your incision is in the true lumen. Otherwise, you won't find that uh, elephant trunk. But of course, you will probably have fenestrated the the dissection as far as you can reach. That's the best way to put your elephant trunk in. So if you have done that, you don't have to worry. And then one more technical point is if you have a very high intercostal up near the level where your elephant trunk is sewn, that can be very difficult to reach. And you're always afraid to cut too far in opening the aneurysm proximally towards your elephant trunk. You're afraid you might cut the suture line or, or the stitch. And sometimes that can be troublesome, a high intercostal. So now I'd like to 
you've seen lots of graphs about deep hypothermic arrest. I've shown you some. Dr. Harrington, the others showed you uh, graphs. I think this one patient speaks volumes. And you'll probably remember it better than any graph of this or that neuropsychometric parameter. She's a 78-year-old lady. This is 7 a.m. Marianne, who's with me, is doing this uh, video the following morning, the morning after her operation. And she had a total arch replacement under straight deep hypothermic arrest, I think about a 39-minute arrest time. Now, my name is very difficult to spell. It's even more difficult to spell backwards. But please watch. I hope we have the sound for this. If you take and spell your doctor's name forward, E-L-E-F-T-E-R-I-A-D-E-S. And reverse. S-E-D-A-I-R-E-T-S-E-L-F. You are awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Are there any uh, questions on the floor? The first question, though, did she manage to uh, perform that before the circus? <laughs> <laughs> she did. <laughs> Perhaps I can raise one point. I, I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue about fishing for the uh, elephant trunk because I do think that is probably the, the most difficult part of the stage two operation most of the time. Are there any... Does anybody else do it any different way? I, I, I Just start to buy like oh, uh, um, Hazm, slash and grab. <laughs> it was a big slash and big gush of blood in there. My little heart can't take it. <laughs> so, so they step and started using a PRD ultrasound to see where exactly the elephant trunk is. And then so I'll see the distal aorta and then I'll clamp the distal aorta and then I'll clamp from the outside the kind of proximal aorta, then they open it and then put the clamp on. And so I find it a little bit more kind of uh, control for me. No, sorry, I just was going to ask, uh, actually, why don't you do this, why don't you do it this way? Why do you have to stab and grab and go fishing and hunting? Why don't you just put clamps and right. do it that way? And we do that, but when you have a really big um, distal arch and ascending aorta and you've kept your elephant trunk short, it can be very difficult to get around. And again, as I mentioned, you, you do have some risk to the esophagus and uh, you have... Uh, some risk getting around the aorta, the, the far wall of the aorta, and the nerves. I do it both ways. If it's comfortable, I clamp it. If it's not comfortable, this other way, once you do it a couple times, really, uh, you're fine. We've never, we've never had a uh, 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 catastrophe or problem with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir.